Good evening, good evening, Mr. Kasparov. It's great to have you here. We are all really interested what you're going to say about chess and politics and the rest, if there is something else, of course, There's in something world. else in between, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so let us start. Um, it's about 5 p.m. just now. It's a bit late. So My was... apology for being late. So how many, how many games of chess did you play today? Today? Today. I, well, I sign many books, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> you yeah. see, I live in this deep conviction that uh, it must be an addiction. You know, when, if you are a chess player, if you are on the top for 20 years, then every single morning when you wake up, the first thing that you have to do, you have to lean over the chess board and do something. Um, but, uh, first of all, today, most of the chess players, they look at a computer screen rather than a chess board. <laughs> But uh, you should also not forget that I'm not, uh, uh, I'm no longer a professional chess player. Sure. Uh, so I remember how to move the pieces, <laughs> but uh, if, if I want to think about the game, I don't need a board either. So yesterday I looked at the games played by these kids at the championship, so I uh, followed the game, especially those kids that I knew. Uh, and today my chess activity was so far zero. Okay. So I may still look at you know a screen when I'm back in the room, but it's unlikely. But I'm not sure that you should try to make chess sound like a drug. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. But tell me something. You still do chess analysis a lot, I believe. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you approach this task? Um, when I write the book. Uh, I definitely, you know, I just I go through the games, I look at the screen, I have chess engines, so that's the, everybody that uses them now. Uh, that's pretty much it, so I'm not, uh, I'm not doing the same quality analysis as I'm used to do, because I'm no longer playing professional chess. So it's, uh, you should understand that your concentration level, unless you are playing, and um, professional game will not be the same. I mean, just, it's the, and, and unlike you are in, in the midst of the battle, uh, your, um, uh, your ability to, uh, sorry, your vigilance will not be at the same level. It's funny you say that because when there was this famous match between uh, Gelfand and Anand, I believe. Actually, it was this year. And it was interesting to follow the debate uh, after that because uh, you said that Anand uh, lost a bit of concentration and with concentration he lost a bit of precision and then everyone was going on, was Gary Kasparov right to say that? Uh, was he um, in a position to say that? Obviously, whatever you say, it's still extremely influential in the chess world. Look, you know, I think that we're all in a position to criticize each other. And after criticizing Putin, I feel free criticizing Anand. Uh, I think the game, his game today, nowadays, in the last few years, is a very, it's like a shadow of what I used to see 10, 20 years ago. I don't think there is anything wrong about saying the obvious. Um, I think it's, it's unacceptable when the world champion, somebody who carries a title, hasn't won a single chess event in four years. Uh, and it's clearly it's a result of him losing, first losing determination. Uh, uh, it's passion to play and to win, to make the difference. And then, of course, losing concentration because it all follows. Uh, I think it's sad. I, uh, you didn't see me saying such things about my former colleagues with great joy, but it's a fact. And, uh, and also, I think it's a little bit odd now that... Uh, the world champion and his challenger 
you know, in the second decade of 21st century, they were over 40. The world is getting younger, the chess world is also getting younger, and you had the match, if you combine the age of two, two opponents, 42 and 43, one of the oldest in the history. So the combined age was even more than Batvinik Smyslov. So that, uh, I think the, 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 there are certain inconsistencies with the development of chess. And uh, not that I'm a guardian of the game, but I feel very strongly in expressing my views uh, regarding the, this, this current, what I believe is crisis. If you look at your younger colleagues, the ones that you mentioned just now, and if you remember the games you played against Karpov, let's say in 84, 85, would you say they lack the present games, this sophistication, the beauty that was determining the games you were playing at the time? I mean, technically speaking, Anand and Gelfand also my younger colleagues. colleagues. So I'm uh, uh, six, seven years older than... than, than sure. okay. No, five and six. Five years older than Gelfand, six years older than Anand. But I started earlier. Uh, we, um, and so we have, I may consider myself a, a generation before them. So um, now the younger colleagues is those who are now in 20s and early 30s. Sure. Uh, but when I look at the game, let's say playing by Magnus Carlsen versus Levon Aronia, we take number one and number two in the, in, the, in the list, rating list, I would not say that the precision or the quality of the game is lower and, and the game is worse than one I played against Karpov. Um, we always are thinking about the old glorious days. Of course, in our old glorious days, things were better. In chess, we saw, unfortunately, we saw a decline. When I played Karpov, or when Spassky played Fischer, that was a big story. Most likely, we had to attribute it to the political clash. Fischer, Spassky, Cold War, USSR, United States. It was more than chess. Kasparov, Karpov, old and new in the Soviet Union, perestroika, new thinking, uh, opening up. So chess hasn't managed to adjust to the modern world without this political background. That's why today you ask people, this audience I think qualified, but because we already talked about it, but in many audiences I could ask who is the world champion? and nobody will, will, will answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember that about, uh, actually this year, I spoke at a very prominent business conference in Munich. There was a room, well, there was about probably 50 people. And we're talking about a very prominent group, you know, of senior vice presidents of the big corporations, uh, highly intelligent, and we talked about it, and I asked this question. There was silence, and then one hand raising it. I said, Vichy Anand? He said, wow. And the man looked Indian for me. He said, yes, he's my relative. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened to chess after it stopped being a big political event? No. I think the natural process could be for chess, and it should be, to become a game that has its you know, right place in this new environment, sports, culture, education, and we failed. Uh, you have to, in the modern world, you have to rely on the sponsorship. Sure. And the sponsorship depends on your ability to sell your story. So what is your story? We are not football, so, which doesn't have to sell anything. It's a number one game everywhere. Uh, we have to present a story. And unfortunately, the story of chess in the last 20 years was not very attractive. The way Fidi, uh, chess has been ruled by International Chess Federation, by uh, its president, Mr. Ilham Zhinov, and also the conflicts surrounding the game, uh, they 
created an image that no corporations would like to touch. Mm -hmm. uh, just imagine today if you have a co potential corporate sponsor that will Google the game of chess and it looks for FIDE, International Chess Federation, and Ilumjina. First things he will see will be aliens, the story of Mr. Ilumjina meeting aliens, meeting Gaddafi, meeting Assad. What are the chances of Google's or Intel's or Coca Cola's of this world even to touch it? Now, also, chess hasn't managed and we all share this guilt, to find its, its spot you know, in, 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 in this big picture. I think we are very late in, in, in approaching this educational angle. I believe chess belongs to the classroom. And again, we don't have yet enough um, momentum in the world of chess to actually make it happen. Chess failed to earn its spot in, 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 in the cultural environment. All attempts were to make chess part of the sport uh, environment, uh, to become members of International Olympic Committee, full members, to go for this illusionary goal of getting funds from the local Olymp Olympic committees. Yeah, I, I think chess is a sport, but I think it's much more uh, complicated and, 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 and exciting rather being just, just a narrow, narrow sport. And competing with physical sports is almost impossible. So chess had to find its, 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 its room, its, its, its place, you know, maybe at the nexus, at the, at the crossroad. I, I feel that now we, we have a chance of actually getting back and, 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 and making the right moves. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to use my old chess skills to help the game of chess in this, in this crucial moment. You know, in your book, you were describing how chess reflected the certain social atmosphere. Uh, you were describing the certain phrases that were used, like peasants are the soul of chess, mm -hmm. just before the French Revolution. Then you had the whole Botvinnik school that, mm -hmm. of course, had this Soviet science uh, spirit atmosphere. Then, of course, uh, Mr. Kasparov arrives with his bold moves that may be anticipated democratic chess. What about nowadays? What does chess reflect of the modern society that surrounds us? Uh, it's a, thank you it's, for the question. It's, very, it's, it's, it's a very good one because it, it reflects not only the fact that chess has been somehow lost. Because you mentioned not just chess reflecting a, a certain period. You always mention names of people who were behind the theory or uh, a concept, you know, like uh, François Philidor, who came up with this, you know, pawns or souls of the game, or Botvinnik, or you may talk about Tal or Karpov or Kasparov. Today, as we already discussed, there are no individuals that could be easily associated with current momentum. But that, that brings us to the second question. And what is the current momentum? Yeah. What is this the is, current that's the, momentum? That's the big issue. I think it's not only for chess, but also a question for the rest of the world. Uh, unlike the periods of, let's say, 50s and 60s, USSR, Soviet Union, the Cold War, space race, big competition, two systems, huge expectations about the future, or then 80s, perestroika in the Soviet Union, collapse of the um, Eastern Bloc, Berlin Wall goes down, big expectations again. Today what? So what are the big expectations of, of tomorrow? What is the very distinct flavor of our time? I think this is the question that we all have to answer, and uh, so maybe it will help chess as well. But let me ask you a very, maybe, naive question. For instance, will you distinguish the chess that is being played by Anand and, for instance, chess that you, it's being played by you or an American or Bobby Fischer? Would you say that chess carries the cultural background of society where chess players no, come from? Absolutely, but uh, again... But what about nowadays when society is over-globalized? I mean... Yeah, but it's the, it had an impact on the preparation Again, we, we briefly touched computers, screens, and the chessboard. It's not an old-fashioned preparation when you have notebooks, you know, when you look at the chessboard, you move the pieces. Now it's all on the computer screen. So you just 
move, the, move, move your mouse or, you know, on the touch screen, use your finger. Today, any chess player, age 12, 13, who concentrates on the game of chess, he knows much more than Bobby Fischer knew 40 years ago. Which, again, is natural because, obviously, today, any student or any teenager who, interest, who has interest in science knows much more than Einstein and Newton combined. So what? So that's the, it's, it's about amount of information available and also about your ability to, to retrieve the information from, from the database. Uh, but obviously, the amount of knowledge we receive without any labor, because I remember when I had to collect information, uh, I had to go through, this note, through the magazines, I was treasuring the chess informator, you know, Yugoslavian chess informator, <laughs> You know, when I could look at the, the games played by great players, I was making notes. It took time for me to collect my little database, and I was very proud. Today, just, you know, pushing one button, and it's, it's, it's there. I think it, it saves time, but it endangers creativity. You don't have to be that, that creative. So, whether you want it or not, there is an illusion that every answer is on the computer screen. And it's not, it's not only about chess players. You go to any business. Well, I propose we go back a little bit, a little bit back, back in, time. in time. Back in time, yeah. Then we will talk about Big Blue and uh, the rest of the things. That's also back in time. <laughs> it, that's correct. You were born in Baku, Azerbaijan, yes. to uh, Armenian mother yes. and father who, father who was Russian Jew, yeah? Okay, we may call Soviet Jew. So, so what does that make you? What do you call yourself? What are you? Armenian, Jewish, Russian? You used to be Soviet. That was easy at the time. Yeah, but it's the... Does no, it matter? The answer, the, answer is, the answer is very much, you know, it's part of nature of the Soviet state, which you may consider a, a successor of Russian empire. And as any empire it had, it, it, play, it, it played a role of a melting pot. So you had people um, uh, like me, and my family, in similar situations somewhere in the French Empire outside of France or a British Empire somewhere in India. So they came back, uh, you know, just carrying different ethnic mixtures. They could belong to different ethnic origins, but at the end of the day, they were parts of uh, of the same cultural language and historic environment. So Baku unlike many other capitals of Soviet republics, for instance, Yerevan of Armenia or Tbilisi of Georgia, it was the, um, you may call it South, uh, Southern Imperial Outpost. It was a Russian-speaking city. Mm -hmm. So they were all the nationalities. They uh, melted in, in, um, in, 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 in what you may call the Soviet people. So people who spoke Russian and belonged to the same cultural matrix. So in my family, my mother's family, there were three daughters. My mother married a Jew, the second married an Armenian, the, the youngest married an Azeri. So that's why we just had, you know, the family and all cousins sure. who belong to the same, you know, blood origin, we are quite different. And our kids, you know, uh, they, they don't even understand the nature of the question because they, are, they live in Moscow now. And when many people ask me, why did you move from Baku to Moscow? I said, I was born in the country where Moscow was a capital. And I still live in the country where Moscow is a capital. Sure. So I just, empire has shrunk. As you know, after the collapse of British empire, many of those who believe the Brits moved from India to, 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 to the shores of the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, by language, culture, education, by Historic perspectives, I'm Russian also, I don't have a, a drop of Russian blood. Tell us, uh, Mr. Kasparov, how do you remember those old times of Soviet chess comparing to the modern chess atmosphere in Moscow, let's say, nowadays? Um, no, if, so my youth did not take place in Moscow, so I grew up in Baku and it was a different environment. So Moscow I visited occasionally on the way to the foreign tournaments. Because you know, you, at that time you couldn't fly outside of Soviet Union unless you you uh, cross borders in, in the capital. Um, there is it's it's there's always a temptation to say that 
those who are much better days. And there are a number of reasons to say that, because state was part, uh, um, state was very, um, paid a lot of attention to the game. So you could study the game. They, they, there were resources allocated to find Karpov, Kasparov, or other great players, and to make them great, to represent our country abroad. Um, but we are always guilty of trying to exaggerate the beauties of the past, because we're young. And there are many great things happening to us that are not going to happen now. So, and uh, I am always very cautious in giving these glorious assessments of the past. Because it was still Soviet Union, it was still a communist dictatorship, and if I could uh, enjoy certain benefits by being a great chess player, I, even I couldn't escape uh, the pressure of the regime when I began playing at a high level and was threatening carp of supremacy. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. What kind of pressures oh, it's, um, were there? You know, every system of that type, uh, uh, every non-democratic uh, regime, f fears to lose status quo. And I don't think that at the beginning of, of um, Kasparov Corp of uh, uh, tension, uh, even before we played the match, the Soviet authorities looked very much on my uh, ethnic origin. I don't think that was a big reason. Armenian Jewish, it was less important than the fact that Karpo was their guy. It's like a soldier of the party. And he was a great symbol of the stability, some may call stagnation of the regime. Uh, and uh, the words spoken by Brezhnev when he received him after Karpo won second match against Korchnoi, so you took the crown and keep it. That was very much you know, a signal to every bureaucrat. You know, you can't touch the status quo. But you were not very political at the time. Uh, the chess was no, your main... I, 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 I would say until, you know, I didn't have much of illusions about Soviet Union, but uh, I grew up, you know, in the intellectual circles uh, in, in Baku, so I uh, had my, my father's relatives, these Jewish intelligences, so I read enough books, you know, including Solzhenitsyn and others. Um, but at the same time, I had one goal, a narrow goal, to become the world champion. So, and I didn't want to do anything that could jeopardize it. So you have to join the Communist Party, you have to do that. So I didn't do anything that I should be ashamed of now, but uh, I didn't want to do at that time anything that could uh, totally throw me off the balance. Uh, now, in 84, 85, when I actually had the first collision with the system, I became much more political. And clearly in 1985, when I gave my interview to the Spiegel magazine, mm -hmm. Der Spiegel, uh, in Germany, sure. and that was the, uh, uh, like a, you know, a bomb for Soviet authorities, uh, I just recognized that this fight with Karpov would go way beyond, you know, my attempts to change the situation in the world of chess. Um, um, I still had hopes for maybe for a couple of years, 85, 86, maybe somehow 87, that under Gorbachev leadership, Soviet Union can um, go through this peaceful transition into this something more appropriate and, 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 and pleasant. But uh, then I just lost my hopes. I saw that Gorbachev wanted to preserve not exactly the status quo of Brezhnev's time, but still to preserve the regime. But where do you see the positive political forces in Russia? Today. Today. Is this the new coordination council that was recently established uh, with online voting that we all followed? At the now look, uh, I'm against the violence, as I just mentioned now, and I'm in favor of any uh, meaningful way of expressing public opinion, which is, number one, is voting. And that's what every non-democratic rule does first, you know, to eliminate the uh, connections between the public and the government. And uh, elections is a key element. Also, mass media is very important to make sure that you can hear, we can see the reflection, like in the mirror. So, 
Putin has been gradually eliminating all the layers of the, of the public control of the government institutions. And the reason I believe the Coordination Council is a huge step forward, because first time in many years, we had elections. Some people say small elections. A only 82,000 people voted. Most of them online, 75% online, 25% offline. Uh, but we did it very much against the, 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 the state will. The power of the state was used to prevent us from running it. Now, that was absolutely transparent because every voter was registered. Online, you could, you could see your vote. You, could, you, you knew that it's you, so it's no one could steal it, which, by the way, uh, brought down the number of people who could vote because without such protective measures, we could have many more, many more people. But we couldn't uh, do it without protection since we could expect clones, yes, yes uh, flouting our system. Now, it was a short campaign, only two months, but it wasn't open. You knew the candidates. And uh, at the end of the day, we elected something that has a legitimate power. Again, it's relatively small, but it, unlike Putin's elections, you can verify it. It's transparent. No one knows how many people voted in Putin's uh, elections because even the list of the voters in Russia, it fluctuates. So you can have one million less, one million more, which for Slovenia may sound strange. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, mysteriously, some people, you know, are getting born or, or, or died in the contrary prior to the election. So you can see fluctuations. And, of course, if you look at the election map presented by Gorbachev's, oh, Putin. Putin's. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'm... It's in the time, time, new, time loop. Time loop. <laughs> so, yeah, it's tough. Um, presented by uh, Putin's, um, as they call him, magician, Mr. Churov, the head of the Central Election Committee. You will see inconsistencies that cannot survive if you apply laws of mathematics. And I'm not even talking about elections in the regions where uh, Putin's result was over 100%. Let's set them aside. I'm not even talking about Chechnya or other regions where Putin makes 99.9%. .9%. Let's set this aside as well. We're talking about polling stations in the same city, sometimes across the street, where on one polling station you can have 80% or another on one 30%. And the, the results are published. They don't even care to, 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 to bring them together. And going back to the coordination council, you could see something that makes this, our small elections absolutely transparent because you look at the map and you could see that Moscow versus regions, the results are authentic, the same. The same 30 people were elected by Muscovites and by the regions. You, look, you go from region to region. If you have more than 400 people voting, the results are almost you know, authentic. And most important, online versus offline. Because everybody says online, it just it's distorts the picture. Out of 30 people that were selected in the list, there was only one name different. 29 names were the same. So which tells you that, again, the, the laws of mathematics, the big numbers, it survives even in Putin's Russia, unless it's touched by the magicians. But there is this impression, in spite of what you're saying now, that, okay, people will know about that in Russia. You speak about that in Russia, maybe not that publicly as you would want it because of the mass media situation and Putin's influence on mass media. But uh, as an outside observer, one could say that people will remain silent because um, they don't want the change. At the moment, they don't want big changes. And that makes me ask the question, who's actually your opponent? Is your opponent Putin and his circle, or this, you know, largely passive public opinion that's not going to say, look, election was a fraud? Who's your opponent? Uh, let's start with all the assumptions, because your question contained a number of assumptions that I have to respond to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, number one is you use the word Putin influence. You can say Obama may influence American press. Putin controls Russian press. <laughs> Let's agree it's a fundamental difference. I, we, we talk, we talk, and it's on the internet, yes? 
Sure. And people in this country can hear me, yes? I was not on Russian television for six years. So how in this world you suppose I can talk easily to people from Vladivostok unless I go there to find out that I'm not allowed to even to rent a hall to talk to the public? So yes, we are trying to spread our message. Yes, modern communications, internet helps us. But in Russia, with all the internet numbers growing, it's still not equal to channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four which is a 24-7 brainwashing propaganda. Hard to respond. Um, now, about the public opinion being passive. That's an interesting question, you know. What, how do you measure this public opinion? Um, there must you, be some kind of measure, even in... Yeah, that's already said, you know. Um, uh, if you ask people about the way they live, you could see that all the numbers for the regime are not good. The moment you ask them about personalities, suddenly numbers change. Because what is the public, uh, what is opinion poll? How do you conduct it? You call someone and you ask his or her opinion. People who are responding, most of them are born in the Soviet Union. And they know what happens in Russia. If somebody calls you and asks your opinion about Mr. Putin, I'm still surprised that nearly 40% say it's negative. So you could not trust all these positive numbers, and that's why I say the number I could trust is what I saw at the polling station, which I think it's, in Moscow was a pretty good reflection. Even with all the resources that were behind the elections and uh, all the people that, that, that were forced to vote because they were working in the state control institutions, the numbers for Putin are not as great as they presented, but even when you look at the official numbers today, official numbers, they're all going down. But we live in a country where, you know, public opinion, unfortunately, I have to say, outside of Moscow, makes very little, if any, influence on the political change. If you want to protest against Vladimir Putin, you have to see Kremlin stars. You have to go to Moscow. That's what happened on the big rally of May the 6th in, in, uh, in Moscow, when we had many people, including a few thousand from St. Petersburg, joining the protest because that's the only way to say that you reject the regime. And uh, having hundreds, thousand plus, and that's what we had a few times this year, demonstration in Moscow, in the country where people expect that the demonstration may be very damaging for you, both physically and, and politically, they, you may lose your job if you are detained by the police. I mean, that's, the, that's quite a serious, quite, uh, quite a serious um, uh, um, challenge to the regime. And uh, I think that analyzing the trend, I would say that uh, uh, the days of the regime are now numbered because it outlived its historical, imp positive historical importance. Yes, we still think that Putin and his circle and his cronies are greatest problem for Russia. But it's about offering people the vision of the future. Uh, people are no longer supporting the regime because of the hope. It's inertia. As we already discussed, status quo is a big word now everywhere. In Russia, there is a genetic fear against change, especially after the 90s. Supporting change could mean that you end up with, with a mess. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless people can see a clear perspective, they will not move in millions to the, to, 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 to the street. And uh, I believe that this is the out, out most important goal of the opposition, to demonstrate that the future without Putin could, um, could offer hope. So restoring the hope of, of the nation. But how far would... Putin go in the treatment of uh, opposition, political opposition leaders like yourself, for instance, you were arrested in the summer. What was the treatment? I'm survived. Yeah, yeah you I'm, survived. I'm, okay. I'm, yeah. You look also, well. Also, this is a compliment. Yeah, okay. so. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's the, the, but there are certain scarves of every arrest, uh, both physical and, and psychological. Um, but how far would he go in the uh, treatment of Gadi Kasparov, for instance? Yeah, you know, it's, I would separate 
this, the, the treatment of Gary Kasparov and uh, many of my friends and colleagues who are either under criminal investigation or some of them in jail already. Putin's regime, unlike classical dictatorship, depends very much on the Western favors. They keep the money not in Iran, not in China, not in Venezuela. They keep money in, 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 in the foreign banks in Europe or in America. They cannot break up all the relations, so that's why they have to make sure that they are respecting certain balance. And obviously, going after Gary Kasparov would be the last thing they'll do. They, they already, by the way, show that my name is not yet a full protection, but again, I, I'm still here, so I can travel. And I, 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 I could be physically well. Now, but if you look at the overall trend, it's getting worse. People just, you know, being arrested, detained. Uh, as we speak, I'm sure many of them interrogated, they're harassed, and the courts are simply stamping convictions, verdicts without uh, uh, paying any attention to the evidence. Uh, one of the most ridiculous cases, a small one, but and not of course publicized because no one knows the man, uh, about the arrest of one of our activists who was standing with a poster protesting repressions and torture alone, which is legal by Russian constitution. He was standing there saying no to repressions and tortures. He was arrested by the police. Uh, they didn't pay much respect to, to, to his privacy, so they, just, they, they were quite rude. It was all recorded by you know, one of his friends. It, it was recorded. And the court threw him in jail for 15 days on uh, the verdict of um, resisting police, police arrest. And when the videotape was presented in the courtroom, the judge was not even shy to write in her verdict that the videotape cannot be trusted because it um, contradicted the testimony of the police officer. Terrible. It's a small case. We have much bigger cases now. But the, this is the tr trend and this is the flavor of Putin's justice. Personally, I believe that if his power is threatened, Vladimir Putin will push every button he can. Mm -hmm. Yes, he will give an order to shoot people in the streets. The question is not whether he will do it or not. I think after so many years in, in power, being uncontrolled, he will react rather like Gaddafi, not Mubarak. The question is whether he will have enough people who will execute his order. And that still remains to be seen. And from what we hear, you know, like a vibrations of this rock, the monolith of the power, I think there might be a problem for many, even of his most trusted lieutenants, to go that far. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a very fragile situation, because unlike Syria or Libya, Russia is a nuclear superpower. And to have a paranoid man who can do whatever to stay in power could be dangerous not only for us, but also for the rest of the world. But tell us something. When you are in Russia, you are surrounded by bodyguards. If you call one bodyguard a crowd, okay. yes, surrounded. Yes, <laughs> I'm surrounded by one bodyguard. <laughs> are, you, are you careful what you eat and where you eat? Uh, you don't fly no, I, Aeroflot, I believe. Uh, no, no, I do fly Aeroflot now. It's just it's the, uh, uh, if I have to, because I live in Russia, so it's hard, hard to avoid flying, so not long distance. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, uh, when people ask me about bodyguards in Russia, you know, it's just, you, you should not be mistaken. They will not protect you if the state goes after you. And some of my bodyguards, because they, just, they rotate, they have been arrested with me and they also sp spent a few days in jail. You know, for ex-police officers, it's quite a psychological challenge. Uh, <laughs> but because we offer no resistance, of course. We, we, never, we never had any act of violence on our side. But you, in Russia, you should be also afraid especially in my case, of the unprovoked attacks. It's not the state. It could be a cooligan attacking you. Or remember Anna Politkovska shot in her, you know, just in front of, of the doors of her apartment. Those are the attacks that bodyguards can prevent. Okay, not prevent. They can make it much more difficult to organize. This is this. You know, I pay quite a great deal of money just to offer me and, and my family who lives in Moscow some, some 
sort of protection, it's an element of confidence that we will not be subjects of this um, sudden physical assault. But tell us something, if Russian politics under Putin would be a chess game, I mean, where is the Russian opposition now? Is it still in the face of opening? Are we anywhere close near the middle game or not yet? I would be very cautious to compare Russian politics or whatever you name Russian politics with the game of chess. Because in chess we have fixed rules and unpredictable results. In Russian politics it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, but the question I yes, ask is yeah. how successful the opposition actually is. We're still there. And this is the, it's the, if you, let's go back to 2005 when I started my endeavor. I'm Did you think it's going to be more or less difficult as it proved to be? It's more dangerous, but we're much closer. Yeah, so, but you know, when, you are, when, when, you're, when you're about to reach the climax of any game, whether it's, you have it in uh, an, the an, um, medieval battleground or in, in a business uh, environment or in political campaign, it's getting hotter. So when you are about to reach the climax of the um, uh, public opposition to the dictatorship, it could be extremely dangerous. And I think, I'm afraid, I think the outcome will not be without violence, which I resist, but I'm afraid it's not for us to call the shots. You know, it could be even literally calling the shots. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, um, uh, when I started in 2005, you know, if you want, if you insist me to give chess assessment, so it was a situation where, you know, your king is under, under threat of being mated in one. You don't have luxury of thinking about strategy. What I will do in the end game, how can I improve my pawn structure, how I take control of the center, it's, it's about survival. So the entire strategy of the opposition, from my perspective, was to survive, you know, and just to keep going. And we did. We're still here. And we, if you had a few thousand people in 2006 on the streets, now you, you, you think 40,000 is not enough. So people say oh, it's, it's too small. 100,000 or more, that would be required. So we already saw 120,000 ones. So the trend, I think it's positive. But again, it's, we're reaching the climax. Tell us the modern Russia you are describing nowadays. Do young Russians care about chess more than, let's say, the, the rest of the world because of the tradition, because of everything what Russians or Soviets did in the area of chess? Um, the answer, of course, is no. They, 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 they do care much less. But this is, again, this, there's nothing wrong with the, with the public mind. Just people had more options to exercise. 30, 40 years ago, when I started playing, so just in actually already more than 40 years, uh, the parents had very little choice for their kids. They could go for sports, they could go for music, maybe for science, so just it's the ballet. Uh, no politics, no business, no law, so this, the options were extremely limited. You didn't like the ballet, so... Yeah, no, 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 I'm just, okay, I, my, my, father's, my father's family, you know, they all were, you know, musicians, so it, I was an exception. <laughs> so, um, I just think it's very natural where people are trying to find uh, the best future for their kids. And uh, if you have millions of kids being tried on chess, your chances to find Karpov Kasparov are much higher than if you have 50,000 kids in New York, Chicago, going through the network to find Bobby Fischer. So it's all about big numbers. I don't believe there is the special uh, like a genetic assignment for the game of chess in ex-Soviet Union. It's all about numbers and traditions. So traditions were built. And they're very much alive, but we don't have the same numbers of, of kids getting in. So uh, it all depends on the combination of the state influence and uh, the public determination. Uh, if you look at the most prominent chess nation today, it's a very small state, you know, just 
a bit bigger than Slovenia, Armenia. Uh, it's a 3.5 million people, but they won three out of last five chess Olympiads. Very strong team. And the reason they're doing so well is that chess is in the schools. It's, a man, it's the only country that has a mandatory a chess education. Uh, just for, for start, starting just it's, uh, two years ago. Uh, what, it helps, what helps this progress is that the president of the Armenian Chess Federation happens to be the president of the country. Sure. <laughs> uh, but it also shows the, the, the respect for the intellect. While in Russia, it's exactly the opposite. The Putin's regime shows total contempt to the intellect because such dictatorship, they, they're they, suspicious of any intellectual activities because they know historically that the protest is always boiled within intellectual circles. So that's why chess is not being totally deprived. There's still some funds available, but it's not uh, the same state support and public affection than before. So what are you trying to achieve with Kasparov Chess Foundation? Um, and where do you concentrate your efforts? No, ideally, you know, it should be global. But you start where you have funds available for, uh, for your work. Uh, I started in the United States 10 years ago because there were enough people there who wanted to support the future of their kids. We have plenty of rich people in Russia, but they invest elsewhere, not in our country. So, because part of Chess Foundation started in America in 2002 with the goal to come up with a blueprint for schools where chess uh, um, could be taught for, for kids. We had enough evidence at, already at that time that small injection of chess at early age could have a tremendous effect on kids, both educational and also social effect. Because we, ha we have been working in most prestigious private schools in the country, in the United States, and also in, a, in, in, in the underprivileged schools in, in the cities. Uh, and we saw the, 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 the positive results. It's not only just, you know, scientific study, but you could hear reaction of the parents, of the headmasters, and you could see that it has a very good community effect. Uh, last year, I opened Kasparov Chess Foundation Europe in Brussels with an attempt to spread around the idea and to capitalize on many programs that have been uh, um, opening up in Europe. It's quite surprising if you start looking at the data, how many schools in every country have separate chess programs. The problem is no one could bring them together and just to maximize the effect of, of um, chess in education. And I am a great believer that chess in education could be a very important bridge from the classical, old-fashioned classroom that hasn't changed over 100 years into the modern in educational environment, especially you know, with the iPad generation, where kids are getting very upset if information doesn't go both ways. It's, it's interactive. And the classroom has a teacher as the only source of authority that, that you know, uh, deflects every creative initiative. Um, we succeeded in Europe in promoting uh, the, the written declaration uh, in European Parliament, which was, you know, a logistical nightmare because, as you know, European Parliament has many factions. But the good news is that we managed to get votes from every political group, so from conservatives, from socialists, from liberal democrats, from greens, across the spectrum. So it showed that chess has appeal that goes beyond ideological preference. Uh, as for geographical, of course, Eastern Europe donated more votes, uh, percentage-wise, but because the largest countries are on you know, other side, so again, it was, it was balanced. So Slovenia had only eight members of the parliament, but 100% performance. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, uh, um, and this the declaration proved to be useful not only in Europe, in European countries, but also outside of Europe. Because first time you had a, a, a viable political institution publicly supporting 
chess and education. So we have 415 signatures, you know, uh, um, when only 370 was, 78 was required. And I'm successfully waving this piece of paper even, even outside of Europe. Um, the Republic of Georgia signed with us a contract to implement our programs. Estonia has pilot programs. Poland, uh, I've visited officials there, so we'll be joining soon. Uh, some of the German regions, France, they have huge programs, but we're going to work together with the French Minister of Education. Uh, and I'm extremely optimistic about you know, the overall uh, effect uh, in, 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 in across the European continent. And my latest uh, uh, opening was in Africa, in Johannesburg. Sport of Chess Foundation in Johannesburg opened last March. And of course, in Africa, we have slightly different priorities. You're not talking about iPads there. You're talking about very, very simple, primitive lessons to help kids to learn even English, to understand how to count. So you are concentrating on the social uh, programs uh, 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 associated with the game of chess. Mm -hmm. It's even of greater importance in this case. Oh, it's, it's a huge importance. And uh, I saw effect you know, in, it's, it's in, in, in Brazil, for instance, in uh, slums in Sao Paulo, in favelas in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. Uh, how kids who did well in chess gained confidence that they can, could succeed in their life, not only playing soccer or boxing, but they could do something intellectual. And in South Africa, we saw a great deal of <clears throat> healing effect <coughs> on, 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 on kids in this very divided society. Mm -hmm. So, Just how closely really involved are you going to remain with Slovenian <laughs> Chess Academy once it's up and running and are, you, are we going to see you more and more <coughs> coming to Maribor and Ljubljana? Uh, definitely twice a year. Mm -hmm. uh, if everything works well, as we expect, we will use the similar model we use in the United States. Then there is a selection process and you have very strong coaching team here. You have Grandmasters Beliaski and Michal Shishin and also Slovenian chess community is pretty vibrant. All we have to do is just to make sure that there is a proper selection process of kids from all over Europe, because it's European Academy. No doubt it may benefit some of Slovenian players. Sure. Yeah, definitely the, the host has a, has a, a special seat <laughs> for best, best kid or girl, so. Are you hoping to discover many prodigies? Again, in this way as well. I know this is not, not the main aim. No, 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 of no. course. No, actually, yeah. for academy, it now we have to help. And twice a year, I should be here for three-day session to work with the best kids. Seven, eight, nine, so there will be a small group. Again, we are doing, replicating what was successful in Soviet Union and now what we're doing in America. <clears throat> I know we don't have a lot of little children. Well, actually, we have some kids not, sitting not here. Little, but yes. if, if they're planning to become Gary Kasparov one day, no. Tell us, how hard does a little kid need to work, let's Very say, hard. at the let's age see, of seven, I'm, I'm, eight? I'm, how many I'm, hours per day? No, I don't think you can measure it by hours. I think it's more by the passion. So there's this, the, if they are willing to sit at the chessboard or now in the computer screen, I mean, great, so you shouldn't stop them doing so. It's the, um, well, what is your own experience when you were a kid? How long, how many hours per day did you sit leaning over know, the chessboard? I, board, know, I, uh, I spent a lot of time, that's what I remember. Uh, but school was easy, so I just like, and I, I, I did it on my own, that's important. So I, I, I learned to read very early so I could read the chess books and I could look at the games. And uh, I had only one day where, um, at the Pioneer Palace, at the chess section, only on Sunday because it was far away, so and no one could actually take me there. So I just, I had only one day a week when I could go there to play with other kids, to hear the coach. So for the first two years, I was very much on my own, but I loved the game and I played with, with my uncle, who was quite a decent club player. So it, uh, it's, I remember that the passion was the key element. So you, you ha don't have to overdo it. You don't have to push sure. too hard, you know, just not to kill the appetite for the game. But you have to keep it always, always, uh, you know, at a certain level. 
But eventually you became the number one in chess world and which is even more important, you remained there for about two decades, which is probably the greatest success one can make in the chess world. But tell us something, what is the life of number one in chess world like? I mean, one would say, again, as an outside observer, that this is a very solitary position. You know, one has this feeling that, you know, you are there playing your matches, doing preparations, doing analysis. There isn't much, I don't know, wasting time, going out, having fun. Look, but trust me, in every life there's plenty of wasting of time. <laughs> <laughs> How do you if waste I, if time? I look, if I look back at my life, you know, I could easily, you know, explain how half of the time was wasted. It's... You must be joking. No, 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 no. It's just trust you me. can't no, be no, serious no, 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 no. saying it's, this. Time is, time is always wasted. So I believe we, the, the greatest human creativity is on that, on that side, wasting time. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to avoid. You, know, just, you, you can watch the same movies many times. You can do many things that you may consider not very intelligent and not very useful. But we are wasting time, so we just did. And you, when you start analyzing, you know, if I go back now, I could easily find, you know, that was wrong, that was wrong, that was... You know, so it's just... You should try to learn from all, your own mistakes, but not everybody does. And I have to c confess that, you know, I... Look, I also repeated mistakes. So it just, it's, it happens. You were one of the first chess players, professional chess players, that employed an agent. I believe you were the first one. First and one. you were the first one, yeah? And has that changed your life a lot? Like, you had, suddenly you had someone who organizes your life, apart from your wife, of course. I married three times. So. Well, so you had three yeah, okay, wives yes, organizing yes, your no, life. No, okay, Not yes, at the yes, same yeah. time, I hope. So. No, no. Uh, yeah, the, the first agent, you know, uh, w that, that worked with me, it was all back in the 80s, at the time of the Soviet Union. It was very odd because, you know, um, it was not yet a free travel, so partially restricted. Of course, for me, it was not that difficult. difficult. Um, and um, the financial relations with the state were also very odd. So the chess players, they had better arrangements than other, player, uh, other sportsmen. But still, until 1990, I was forced to give up most of my earnings so to, to, to the state. So since 1990, I decided not to take any more assistance from the state. So I just, and I, I cut relations with the sport officials. Sure. So, uh, but agent is, you know, for me, it was very natural that somebody does this work and being paid for that. Uh, also, maybe somehow my active nature, you know, was uh, an obstacle to, to, to help an agent to work, to work uh, on his own. So sure. I, I, often I had my own say of what's right, what's wrong. Actually, many times I was wrong because, you know, just, you don't have to interfere with someone who's more experienced. I've seen one of your agents, obviously, in one of the documentaries that, would, that was made maybe five years ago, and he was saying, okay, Gary Kas uh, Kasparov know what he wants, absolutely. But um, when, when he's behind the chessboard, he's, of course, he's genius. He's genius. He's extremely professional. But um, as a private person, he's, of course, human, and he makes humanely mistakes. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the, I testify for that. So. <laughs> What kind of mistakes? All sorts of mistakes. You know, just it's, again, I, it's going back to wasting time. So all sorts of mistakes. I, I admire that there are certain people who uh, can learn from their mistakes. They make them once and no, don't, don't make them anymore. I'm afraid they exist in the books only. So all it's a great individuals that, that uh, uh, made a lot of mistakes. But now when you read about their lives, you know, you find out that it was all perfect. So that's... I'm sure my biographies also will look like, you know, a perfect legend. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I yeah. have one particular mistake in mind, the one that you proclaimed to be a mistake as well. 93, when you broke away from FIDE, you said yourself that was an uncalculated mistake. Um, uh, it's worse. It was calculated mistake. It was calculated. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's good. So what actually happened at the time? I mean, you, you were relying on support of Nigel Short having a lot of support among the Western players, and it actually did not happen. Was, was that the miscalculation yes, that you did? Yes, uh, you know, it's calculated miscalculation. Exactly, yes, yeah. correct. It was calculated miscalculation. Because I was very much on the impression of the dividing lines of 1989-1990, uh, when the collapse of the Grandmaster Association that I formed with my colleagues and with support of the Belgian businessman Bessel Koch, mm -hmm. uh, when this association was very close in actually taking over World Championship from FIDE, but failed because of this di division between Eastern and Western players. Sure. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, so, uh, was, so was you playing Nigel Short in London, the Times Chess Championship? Was this the first non-political event? Non-political event? Non. Remember, in the beginning, you were saying that big chess events were political. You playing Karpov, Fischer yes, playing Spassky. Yes, what about? No, but okay, but you. Kasparov you, playing Nigel Short. Yeah, but, Short. but you say non-political, but still, as you just pointed out, that this calculated mistake was purely political. That I expected to revitalize the dreams of the 1990 based on the wrong assessment of the situation. So I thought it was still, you know, West-East, but it was very different. I tried to move chess into the professional area without the same support as I enjoyed before, without any, you know, um, financial backing that I, I could... I still raised money from Intel Europe, but it was not the same climate, political climate, that could uh, help me to realize a dream. And the match with Nigel was not political as Gary Kasparov versus Karpov, Anatoly Karpov, but it was still political because it was a split. And it started this schism in the world of chess that, in, in my view, okay, played a very negative role in the development of chess. And while I, I accepted my own guilt for making this wrong move, unfortunately, many of my colleagues didn't have any courage to recognize that if they could rally with me at that time, we could do something good out of this mistake. Because there were great opportunities, but everybody wanted to play safe, you know, to uh, see what happens and uh, not to help Gary Kasparov to succeed because they thought it was a personal uh, crusade rather than it was my attempt to revitalize the chess world and to search for these sponsorship sure. packages that we, we have been missing at that time and we were you know, more badly missing today. But there was another very interesting thing, uh, you playing Nigel Short. I remember the Times Championship and the Hotel Savoy and everything that was going on there. And I remember all the magazines, all the newspapers, all the television, Channel 4 documentaries. I mean, you were treated like a rock star, not like a chess player. How do you remember that? Was, was that? was that good? Did it make you feel all, all right? Or was it something very unusual for a serious chess player? No, actually, if you mention my match, my uh, chess games with Nigel Short, um, the real rock star treatment was not in 93, but in 87. When I played Nigel, who was, you know, the young, rising mm -hmm. British star, and I was, you know, newly born world champion. In February in 87, we played um, a first rapid chess match, 25 minutes each game. It was, trust me, it was revolutionary. Many our colleagues called it even a prostitution. So considering that really? it's, we are ruining the classical nature of the game of chess. And we played in, uh, um, in a disco club, in a um, hippodrome in London, with the stage going up and down, and everybody play, we played a game with black and white tuxedos. So that's the, that was the rock star treatment. So. <laughs> and it, it was quite a phenomenal. So it was all the smoke. So, <laughs> so in 93, it was, it was also quite encouraging. But again, yeah, unfortunately for, for the promotion of the match, Nigel collapsed too early. So, yeah. And after four games, I was already plus three, three wins, one draw. Yeah, he, he kept fighting, but it was not the same excitement. So when I won the match quite handily. Um, 
But so how do you remember the period after that? I mean, you know, I your relations with FIDE and everything. No, how I, I, I think, yeah, I think I, I made a mistake and, and then I tried hard to, to rectify it. So I mean, are you, good? Are, you good? are you good of admitting I made a mistake? Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 wouldn't have, I wouldn't have survived on the top of the world of chess for 20 years if I was not good and following my great teacher's Mikhail Batwinik's advice. You analyze your game, you find a mistake, you confess, you, rec you admit it. So I have no problem with admitting mistakes. I'm doing it all the time. So uh, I wish I could have less opportunities to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, because I believe the objectivity is, 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 is a key quality for long-term survival. Mm -hmm. So you have to be objective. Um, but you complained even after 93, 95, you were saying that professional chess is still prevailed by that old Soviet uh, thought, we are just moving pieces, we don't care about how things is being True. organized. Has that changed by now? Um, not very much. So um, we still don't have the same corporate spirit in, in, in chess as in tennis or in football. Uh, the chess players, they, they're very individualistic, which is natural for the nature of the game, but still there's a corporate interest, a common interest that should bring us together to fight for, you know, for the future of the game. It's not there. Do, do you <coughs> see any of your colleagues who are on the top of the ratings nowadays that have this inclination to move things forward? No. You don't? Unfortunately, no. Some of them are your, uh, some of them are your pupils almost. You supported, you supported the Norwegian number one, many other guys in the game. Let's say that my experience, they shared my experience only at the chessboard, not outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's speak about another very important issue about your big blue experience and of course all about the chess computers uh, when you I believe it was was it 87 when you played 32 different computers 85, 85 and there was I don't know five to seven of them named after you that was in 85 eight, was it actually eight, eight. eight of it's them easy. okay there were four 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 producers so that's why well the score was the score was you won every single yes. every single um, one of them how do you remember that period, that period now? It was really funny that IBM actually never showed any data. Have you seen the data? No. They quickly sort of dismantled uh, the computer. Locked the, no, dismantled the computer. Why Look. was that? Well, give us some, um, um, some theory that, that you have on that. Uh, you can have a number of explanations. What is the most um, probable one? You know, uh, big corporations are very sensitive to release the data. Yeah. So you haven't seen anything at all? Not that what I wanted to see. And what I believed could be the ultimate proof that, uh, uh, of the integrity of machines' decisions. Um, you know, in science, success um, should be proven by repetition. And naturally, you know, playing one match, six games, no other games played in public. They said they played many, but not available. And uh, not being to, um, not being, not, not willing to repeat it in more scientifically proven conditions. You were never ever offered a rematch. No, I, it's, it's, it's to the contrary. I was ever rejected the rematch. <laughs> yeah. No, it's the, for me, you know, it's the, it's, it was a collapse of a hope that this experiment could lead to sort of to, 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 to recognize the frontiers where human creativity meets the brute force of calculation. At what point decisions made purely on the, uh, 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 as a result of the brute force of calculation can match the decisions made mainly on the creativity, on human intuition. Um, and in 96, we played the match. I won the match in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, for me, the 97 was a continuation, not the, not the end of the story. Sure. And um, 
I, I wished we could, we could have continued, uh, of course I won't take revenge, but also I wanted to make sure it's, you know, it's all for real. Uh, if you look today at the chess playing computers, a software that you can buy for fifty dollars, fifty dollars, yeah, absolutely, twenty, yeah, <laughs> and you run, can download run, it run, legally, run, run it on your, run it your on your um, laptop. This engine can do moves of a better quality than Deep Blue, so it's. it's Chess is not just about brute force of calculation. So, of course, the speed of the laptop today is also significant, but still, we could see tremendous progress in programming and the software. Actually, Deep Blue, as far as I understand, it was, you know, had no um, software architecture. It, there were 256 small playing computers connected in one pyramid. So, uh, each of them made roughly 1.5 million positions per second. And the idea was to maximize the, um, this parallel processing power. So to make sure that is 256 multiple 1.5 million would give you the maximum output. And at certain points they reached the level of 150, 200 million positions per second, which is a pretty good return, you know, from the pyramids where very often, you know, Massive data is lost because you cannot have, you know, the full power, you know, just reaching the point. Um, how did Blue play chess and what was, you know, the algorithm? I cannot tell you because unlike with programs like Fritz, Junior, Ripka, Houdini, you don't have the sort of the success, success, uh, um, successive models that could be seen as the gradual improvement in, 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 in their uh, um, uh, chess playing qualities. Uh, still, I think the match had a huge effect on promoting the idea of chess being the playing field to test uh, artificial intelligence versus uh, uh, human mind. Um, and recently, uh, this year, uh, a few months ago, I was honored to be invited to speak at the Alan Turing Centenary in the University of Manchester. And a uh, few people remember that Al Alan Turing, probably one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, a part of decoding German Enigma, he also was a big fan of having, using chess as the ultimate test for computers' intelligence. And he even came up with the first uh, chess algorithm that he invented before even having a computer. <laughs> so it was the, and I had my lecture where I described um, quite in details the sort of the human machine relations in the field of chess. Do you still want to explore some, some venues in this area? Would you, if you would be offered the rematch now, if you would I'm be not, offered I'm, to go into... I, I can only offer my advice to younger players, so I... Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think that the, for the experiments would be welcome. Also, I'm afraid that the, my younger colleagues may not be as receptive to the idea because it's a tough challenge. What I think should be um, changing the rules, apart of some technicalities about access to the database, but, but the key element uh, that requires change is that if you play a match of six or eight games, uh, it, was not, it should not be about winning the event. For human, it should be winning one game. Because all we have to find out in the match is that whether the human being, at his best day, or her best day, uh, could succeed in beating the best computer. Because when we play a number of games, it always fluctuates. So we can play one day well, another day it could be not as good. We could be affected by the bad weather, sure. by family problems, by stock market crash. So it's the, the plenty of things that can easily affect our performance. Now, we need to make sure that humans can concentrate on winning one game to 
also eliminate this the fear of losing uh, and encouraged to take risk. Sure. Because my experience of playing computers uh, tells me that the greatest problem is not ultimate power of a computer. Chess is a mathematically infinite game, so that's why you cannot calculate everything to the end. The problem is that human players are not built for the same as human beings, are not built for the same level of resilience. When we play a human game, two humans, I can make mistake, the favor can be returned because it's a natural game. Even if you take the best games played by you know, Fischer, Spassky, Karpov, Kasparov, I bet you that every game contains some inaccuracies. Maybe small inaccuracies, but inaccuracies. You don't have a perfect game because you don't have to. The moment you are winning the game, you are getting complacent and often your opponent is losing um, power to fight back because it's clear, it's, it's all over. So you always have these inaccuracies. I'm not even talking about mistakes, but just inaccuracies. So in the human game, you can play a very good, high quality game, making 45 good moves, three ingenious moves, and two inaccuracies. And that's always enough. When you play the computer, it is not enough. It will be a draw, you will not win. So just you, you can easily lose because machine doesn't care it's winning or losing. It, it doesn't know what happened yesterday. It, just, it's, it, it plays the game. And the moment you make one inaccuracy, it will grab it. So it's all about this psychological inability of human beings to be consistent over five, six, seven hours of playing with the same strength. There are always little fluctuations. So going back to my proposal, if it's all about winning one game, we may encourage human player to be more consistent, mm -hmm. just to lose all the energy. And I still think that if we apply these rules and create conditions for, um, favorable for human beings, just to you know, recognize that we, we have certain weaknesses that should be treated well, so just not to put too much pressure, I still think that for years to come, the best human player still can win one game and to prove that our best day we still can beat the most powerful computers. <laughs> but after everything <clears throat> you've said, would you say, would you agree with the thought that some people are convinced that the computers are actually damaging chess in this way, in the way that destroy the, exactly the things you were pointing out earlier, intuition, imagination. You know, can you imagine Mikhail Tal playing with computer? And all his, you know, romantic approach to chess would be gone immediately. Look, today tennis players, they have very sophisticated rockets. And I'm sure, you know, with, with, with this new, in, with this new um, equipment, probably number 50 today, probably could, uh, could beat uh, Bjorn Borg playing with old wooden rockets. <laughs> um, I don't think that we should complain about technological progress. Should we, we complain that it's too slow rather than it's too fast? Um, things change and uh, m many old-fashioned techniques become obsolete. So what's wrong with that? So it's, 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 it's a natural progress and uh, I think we have to find a way to get adjusted. Status quo is deadly. I believe in it. And uh, uh, no one is going to uh, uh, doubt the greatness of Mikhail Tal's genius. And we will be still enjoying the games he played and read the great stories about uh, his uh, chess adventures. And the fact is that many of his combinations can be refuted by the computer. I don't think it changes anything at all. 
uh, and it doesn't diminish his greatness. Um, but doesn't it make chess a little bit less royal, you know, less, um, how to say, even, you know, priestly, this, you know, sacred experience of playing chess well, but it gets so banalized by the computer? Look, yeah, uh, the, you can go back and dream about the days where you had uh, Lasker playing Capablanca uh, and... Karpov playing Kasparov. Yeah, okay, Karpov Kasparov, but I, you can go even further down, yes. You may say even Karpov Kasparov. Let's, let's take Karpov Kasparov. The, Kas, Karpov and Kasparov in Moscow at the Hall of Columns or Tchaikovsky Hall, playing the World Championship match, making moves, and you had grandmasters in the press room looking at these moves, and sometimes Karpov and Kasparov making a mistake, a bad mistake. And everybody's trying to, ah, oh, maybe, maybe we're too stupid to understand it. So there's, the, there's still all this, this, is this tension that maybe, maybe they know something we don't know. Today, every amateur with computer, ah, blunder. Oh, how stupid. Okay, Carlson made a bad move. Anand made a bad move. Frankly speaking, when I watch online, you know, some of the games, I see the comments of complete amateurs, you know, say, oh, bad I'm, I'm getting angry, so who are you to criticize? So. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, that's life, you know. Today, you know, you have uh, a Bedouin in the middle of Arab desert with his iPhone having access to more information than Winston Churchill for his entire life. So what? It's just, it's life, you know. I don't think that we should complain about the natural changes. Yes, I'm, I, maybe I'm also dreaming and uh, mourning the old glorious days of chess where, you know, the authority of the world champion or a challenger was, you know, unshaken. But now it's, it, I think it's, we have to find a way to capitalize on these changes. When we have so many players, amateur players, being online, willing to follow the games, we have to try to build something like a new chess Facebook, you know. We have to create environment with these great technologies rather than complaining about it. But aren't you losing time just for sort of, you know, this kind of personal touch? I remember how your colleagues were describing playing you. Again, again, a couple of years younger colleagues. When they were saying, okay, I'm sitting, you know, across the table from Gary Kasparov, and of course he's a genius and he's a total professional and then, you know, he stares at me. Or I make a move and he yawns. I make another move, he stretches, you know, his arms. So it's like this, do you have a time for psych psychological warfare while, while you have to, you know, click this button to get the proper combination that you wanted to see? Mm, no, but it's the, look, the nature of any battle changes. You know, some people can, you know, still dream about the old medieval battlefield, this, the, the knights with the swords. Today, you just push buttons and, 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 and shoot rockets. So, or, or the planes. You know, you, you remember the, in, in the movies we could see the World War I, you know, the old-fashioned, you know, wooden planes, you know, showing unique technique. And now, with this supersonic speed, so it's all different. Yes, I, I'm, I still dream about these, these, these great days. But it's history, you know, it, it, it has changed. You know, it's what under the bridge. So it's good, it, let's read the books, let's make the movies about it, but let's look into the future, not, not to the past. You are really not a conservative man, are you? You, you, you want to move things forward. I, I I'm, have, I have I'm a... trying to, 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 to you know, you know, be part of the tide, you know. It's, and the tide of time goes in one direction. Sure. And uh, if you start looking back, you're getting dizzy. Hmm. Uh, I have only a couple of, uh, of questions left for you. One of them is the book, which unfortunately, unfortunately I left over there where we were putting on the makeup, but brilliant book about life imitating chess. Um, I'm sure that all the, you know, the visitors of today's um, um, table of your speech are going to read it, but anyway, if you would have to sum it up, what 
major things should we learn from this book, from your experience of chess and real life? Uh, to be brief, yeah, because uh, part of the things that you can learn from the book we have discussed today already. Uh, but to be brief is that it's my attempt to summarize my experience in making decisions. And the basic message of the book is that don't try to get a universal advice. Uh, sometimes I have to confront my colleagues on the speak speaking circuit who are offering tips. And people are always willing to hear it, you know, something that I can take with me. Give me a tip. Yeah. You know, so I would like to hear one as well. Yeah, uh, I think that decision making is a unique um, act and it's as unique as fingerprints or DNA. Uh, we all are different and there's nothing wrong about it. Some of us are more dynamic, some of us are more conservative. You should not be complaining about who you are. You should realize who you are first. This is the you look in, inward. You analyze your strengths and your weaknesses, and you should be absolutely objective. And then you recognize what's good for you, because like in medicine, something that may work for you could be poisonous to me, and other way around. You have to recognize how your body works, what are the symptoms of your illness, and then you take medicine. Same with decision making. You have to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. And when you make a decision, you just you look at, at uh, the environment where your strengths will be displayed and opponent's strengths will be, will be diminished. Uh, and um, also making decisions, you should understand that the process of making decisions does not depend on the size, on the magnitude. Decisions made by the big politicians in the process, they are not different from decisions made by people in, 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 in their daily lives. We always consider elements like material, time and quality and uh, I guess it's, it's natural because if you going to buy a new apartment, you will look at these factors, you will look at the price, you look at the mortgage rates, you will look at the location, you will look at the probably time from your, this location to your work, you will look for the possibly of kids for the good schools for your kids, you will look at the a park nearby or waterfront. So you go through the process which includes these elements. When big political decision is made, there's still elements of material, time and quality. So we go through the same process. And while the process the, is the same, the algorithm for each of us is different. And finding your own algorithm, this is key for the success. That's, that's my book. It's, it's more of a dialogue with, 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 with the reader. I urge someone who reads the book to, you know, to start searching insight for, for an answer and not looking for someone to provide you with all the tips that could, could, could change your life. Sure. And another question that I have uh, deals with women chess, of course. Because in your book there is only, I have to say, a little tiny bit about women chess. This is complaint. This is complaint, not a compliment. And actually, you were saying some really weird things uh, in there, like um, that women are not aggressive enough to play chess, and they don't have enough concentration for, you know, to be really good at chess. Did you really mean all that what, that you wrote, or <laughs> I don't believe you were joking, though? Um. So, um, first of all, let's start with the assumption that it's too little. <clears throat> um, uh, as I mentioned, the book is about decision making. <clears throat> and the chapter that, uh, where the women just uh, <clears throat> analyzed uh, is called Men, Women and Computers. I was interested in analyzing the decision making nature. And actually, you know, in the book there are certain examples demonstrating that a difference in decision making Maybe may, may carry pro and cons. In certain situations, women's decisions are much more sophisticated because they look for a different set of priorities and it could fit the situation better than, than the opposite sex. Uh, now, as for chess, I'm quite puzzled by this, you know, persistence uh, of um, many people uh, trying to, you know, fight the facts. I mean, 
As a matter of fact, only Judith Polgar uh, made it to top 10, stayed there for a while, and uh, I guess it's in this case we have an exception that proved, uh, uh, proved uh, um, the rule. Um, yes, the gap between female players and, 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 and uh, ma uh, male players since Bobby Fischer time, just remember, Bobby Fischer was boasting that he could, he could give a piece, extra piece for a woman and still beat them. I, it was boasting, but it was a reflection of the huge gap 40, 50 years ago, which it doesn't exist now. So the gap is much, much closer. So you, I wouldn't imagine as, even the strongest player to give one pawn uh, before the handicap guaranteeing a victory against a strong female player, you know, especially, you know, like the world champion, you know, who you find. So it's because they play, you know, at a, at a very solid grandmaster level. Still, no female after Judith Polgar made it to the top 100. Her sister Susan was there, but she dropped. So that's, let's deal with this, this fact. Now we try to understand why it happens. Because many people say, oh, chess is not physical. So this is not physical, so that's why, uh, you know, um, um, you have to expect women to do better. Now, but chess, chess has certain components that uh, historically are making female players disadvantages. Um, over centuries we had an algorithm of, you know, separating functions and uh, fighting was not a prime uh, um, element in, 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 in female uh, 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 assignments. It has, it's changing. So we, we, we see dramatic change of women participation in, in the society over 100 years, but it cannot change overnight. So uh, uh, women joined the political life, you know, 100 years ago, and in many countries, you know, just less than 60 years ago, so just gaining voting rights. So we are moving in this direction, but still there are elements of human uh, activities where female uh, component is less significant. I know why you are so much complaining about chess. Can you name a very famous human composer, uh, woman composer? Uh, I'm okay. sure I could, okay, but fine. I concentrate no. on okay, chess no, 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 so no, no, much no, 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 now. No, that, but this is, no, 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 that's why the very fact that you cannot... Composing music, architecture, painting. Do you know many f female paintings? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but okay, but no, at the level of Picasso? Okay, go ahead. No, no. Look, Name I mean, one I'm female. asking the question. No, 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 But this is the, we are, in a, we are in the position where, do you know any female painter at the level of Picasso or Dali? Or Chagall? Or Gauguin? Do you know one? So why are you not complaining about that? So what prevents, you know, just take, uh, you know, a piece of paper and draw whatever you want. What's wrong? Probably there are, I'm not giving you answers. I'm just indicating that there are certain problems you cannot simply, you know, play as a PR, you know. Kasparov said that. I'm analyzing facts. I'm not trying to, to invent theories. So uh, I still believe that, you know, the, the, there are certain differences inside us that you know, probably caused by nature, and while the differences are getting less, less relevant, but this, this, they still do exist, and you cannot eliminate them, probably will never do. Okay, just a final, final question. You have two daughters, I believe, and a son. Yes. Do you teach them to play chess? Um, All three of them? <laughs> Look, the, uh, my son, my daughter, eldest daughter is 19, son is 16, and the little one is 6. So only the little one shows some interest <laughs> to the game, and I would call it still limited interest. But she, she may, you know, learn it beyond the beginner's level. Two others showed no Definitely interest. No. <laughs> yeah, and it's, again, it's, it's probably, it's if going back to, you know, to the laws of genetics, that's, you know, they, they say that the talent can be shown in, a, in, in generation, so maybe their kids. Okay, you're waiting I'm for waiting, you know, for their kids. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gary Kasparov, thank you very much for this extremely thank interesting interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.